<laughs> the first official leaders were, in fact, Jean Corley in charge of the investigation, and New York City granted off authority to the engineering firm Thornton and Tomasetti, Charles Thornton, Richard Tomasetti, to be in charge of the site. It was Richard Tomasetti who cleared the decision to recycle the steel, later saying had he known the di direction that the investigations into the disaster would take, he would have adopted a different stance, but I'm not sure what he thought it was going to uh, go towards. There's a crime scene, right? So this is evidence. And the question for me now is, is does anyone smell a rat? So. Yeah, the rat's going to continue on here. There were a lot of restrictions on the ASCE investigation. They, got, they were allowed no access to blueprints. They were not allowed to ask the, for help from the public. The team members were threatened with dismissal for speaking to the press. They had no access to the steel until the first week of October, and it appeared that FEMA was obstructing their investigation. Well, one way to solve that is just to allow FEMA to take over the investigation, and that's what they did. FEMA, uh, the uh, investigation expanded and was named the FEMA BPAD after about a month. A couple of interesting characters who were added at that time were John Gross from NIST, who has a history of oil and gas uh, work, Teresa McAllister from Greenhorn and O'Mara, a major Def Department of Defense contractor, and several other government contractors, and all of these people kind of followed along throughout all of the investigations. It was amazingly consistent, the people who were actually involved in all these different reports. When FEMA took over, approximately a million dollars was allocated from different sources, but only 100000 was spent by December. And at the same time, the President was telling us it costs a lot to fight this war in his State of the Union address. We're paying a billion dollars a month for it. So we had spent, by the end of the year, 30,000 times more on the wars than we had spent on finding out why we were fighting the wars. By January, it was called a half-baked farce. Bill Manning of the Fire Engineering Magazine has a famous comment. It's a half-baked farce. Dick Cheney had called the Senate leader, Tom Daschle, and asked him to limit the scope and overall review of what happened. And President Bush went to Dom Tom Daschle's office to reinforce that message. Meanwhile, a Berkeley professor working on a National Science Foundation study had got himself access to the steel. He, incredible, he was nice to the people at the scrapyard, <laughs> and they let him see the steel. And of course, he was working on a National Science Foundation study. He said the impact did nothing to this building. So now we know the column did not fail. It was a failure of the floor in most cases. So he was very impressed by how little damage the planes had done to the columns in particular. And he, I think, kind of assumed that that meant that the floors had failed. There were some comments made at, around that time that made you think that, that the engineers who had designed the buildings would design them for airplane impacts but, but for no jet fuel fires. Now, that's kind of crazy. I don't know how the, the planes would get to the buildings without jet fuel. <laughs> but uh, Eduardo Kausel, who contributed to the NIST report, and my old boss's boss's boss, Loring Knobloch, the CEO of Underwriters Laboratory. Both of them said similar things. So who would do this? Who would design a, these buildings for aircraft impacts but no jet fuel fires? <laughs> well, the answer is not the World Trade Center's design engineer. These towers were designed by a man named John Skilling. And Skilling had this to say in 1993 when asked if he considered the plane crashes in his design. This was five years before his death after the first bombing of the World Trade Center. He said, our analysis indicated the biggest problem would be the fact that all the fuel would dump into the building. And he went on, but the building structure would still be there. So the guy who designed the buildings said the building structure would still be there. Okay. He had a lot of confidence in his design. These are some pictures from the construction of these buildings. On the left, you can see the towers going up. And actually, the core, which is essentially a self-standing core, went up first, and then the perimeter of the building went up around that. The core columns here, this is a cross-section of a mid-level core column, were these super massive columns. They were typical construction-grade steel, but they were just huge. 
and they went up 47 columns in the middle, and around them were these super strong columns because they were made of super strong steel, 65,000 PSI to 100,000 PSI steel, really strong steel. And all these columns were, were strapped together by what are called spandrels. So they formed a web, this super strong web of steel. And a lot of people talked about the reason that the planes could hit the buildings and not cause a problem because it was this web and the, and the forces would just go around the hole. They would just be directed around the hole by the columns and the spandrels. And that is what happened. So. But what about the fire? And the question is, where is the fire? On the left, you see the Madrid Windsor building from February of 2005. There was a similar fire in Venezuela in 2004. And these fires burned 20 times longer. They burned like torches. And neither, neither of them and many others have never suffered global collapse. Whereas the Twin Towers really had relatively small fires in them. Now this is seen from a distance, but I think we all know that relative to major fires, these were relatively small. So what did the first investigation come up with? This was reported in a NOVA video. It's a famous video that keeps showing over and over on the television. Corley and Thornton, again, were the primary com commentators. They said essentially that fireproofing easily blew off. It was like a cartoon. Just pfft, everything came off. The floors collapsed, and then the columns buckled outward because they weren't lateral, oh, excuse me, laterally supported. The final report actually came out the next month, and the, the verbiage was a pancake type of collapse of successive floors. But that wasn't enough, for whatever reason. That wasn't enough of an explanation. NIST began their drafting their investigation in uh, 2002 June. Again, they're the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Their first meeting, including public comments, and interestingly enough, who are the public? Gene Corley, Richard Tomasetti, Shank Arnair, and other contributors to the official reports. At the time, Gene Corley made a curious comment three times. He said, look at the floor connections. You know, so he really thought at this time it was the floor connections that failed. Okay. Let me give you a heads up, it wasn't the floor connections. This is really interesting. The FEMA, authors of the FEMA reports eventually became the authors of the NIST reports in many cases. There's Teresa McAllister again and John Gross. The three most important parts of the NIST report are sections 1-5 about temperatures and fires, 1-6 about the, the explanation for the actual collapse of the towers, 1-7, which covers the World Trade Center 7, which hasn't actually been completed yet. But these people, who were all authors of FEMA reports, ended up being authors of the NIST reports. And that's curious because the explanations are quite different. <laughs> this one's really amazing. I like this one. This is October 2002. The Silverstein Widling report was intended to provide information for the insurance claim that Larry Silverstein was making. Corley and Thornton Thomasini engineers were involved, of course. The report results were that there was no floor failure of any kind. It was column failure only, which directly contradicts the FEMA report that had just come out five to six months before, the NOVA video, and most other experts. In my opinion, speculation, uh, the floor failure would have indicated design failure, and, and uh, the only thing I can think of is that would lead them to only being, being able to claim one event. Anyway, it's a curious thing. But you have to ask, how did they know, as they said, what's, what happened? Well, we've got so many stories. You know, the first story was the Towering Inferno, just kind of, various experts telling us crazy things. The FEMA report came out saying floor failure. The Silverstein Weidlinger report came out contradicting that, saying column failure only. NIST's got a report that's kind of a kitchen, kitchen sink theory. It's what I call the tin rat theory, meaning they'll never read all this. <laughs> the, the tin rat. I really believe that's what they intended. That they would create this huge report that nobody would be foolish enough, like myself and others, to actually read. But there's a lot in 